Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming out. I know it's a, a busy time of year, especially uh, the day before school gets out. Uh, so thank you for taking some time. Uh, today is the first of hopefully a few of our community visioning workshops. And tonight, what we hope to do is give you an idea of sort of where we are in the Mass School Building Authority process for a potential project, comprehensive project, here at East Long Meadow High School. I uh, probably should have started with this. I'm Gordon Smith, the superintendent of schools. And tonight, you'll get a chance to meet individuals from our owner project manager team, from our design team, and it gives me actually great pleasure to introduce our chair of the school building committee, Mr. Steve Crusoe. Thank you, Gordon. Sorry about that. Minor technical difficulties. I think we're getting resolved. Thank you for coming out. As you know, this is a really critical time for East Long Meadow because after a lot of years of hard work, we have managed to get into the MSBA program. As you'll hear from our project manager and our design team, there are a lot of steps involved in this. There's going to be a lot of hurry up and wait, because based on getting the state funding, you have to pull that state through. So what I would like to do now is I'm going to introduce my, my the school building committee, and then I will hand things off to the owner's project manager, and they will tell you a little bit about who they are and what they do and how the rest of this is going to come together. So you know who I am, you know who Gordon is. Uh, we also have Pamela Blair, who is the Assistant Superintendent for Business in the public schools. We have Joe Dunn, who is the Town DPW Facilities Manager. Frank Page, High School Principal. Heather Brown, East Longmeadow Public School Director of Curriculum. We have Kathy Hill from the Town Council. Stephen Lonergan is the Town Accountant slash Finance Director. Mary McNally, the Town Manager. Elizabeth Margin Boucher, the school committee member. Uh, Greg Thompson, also on the school committee. Bruce Fenney from the DPW is the superintendent. Daniela Labar is the school psychologist. And Ryan Quimby is the town IT director. So now that I have given you a bunch of names that you probably already recognize, I will introduce Ben Murphy from Skanska, and he's going to tell you a little bit about what they do and how they do it. Thank you, Steve. And uh, I am Ben Murphy with Skanska, along with my colleagues, John Benzinger and Victoria Clifford, who are joining uh, remotely tonight. Uh, we're going to represent the owner's project manager uh, for your project. We were lucky enough to be selected by the town. Um, and you'll hear me refer to owner's project manager as OPM. You may hear a couple different acronyms tonight. And uh, if you get too carried away with it, if, there are any, if there's any confusion about what it may mean, please ask that during the, uh, the Q&A portion. Um, so as OPM, um, we will oversee all phases of the project on behalf of the town. So we will really be there throughout the planning phases, which we're in now, and all the way through project closing. So this is going to be a, a great relationship. And it already is, Gordon. It already is. And so our, our team's main responsibilities, as we see it, are to ensure that the project is delivered on time, as designed, and within the approved project budget, whatever that may be. Um, this slide that you're looking at, oh, sorry, I just, uh, <laughs> all right, there we are, there we are. So this slide here, um, it showcases some of the things that Skanska brings to the table as OPM, um, and I won't go through each individual item here, but I do find it important to just call out um, a couple of things here, and that would be our vast MSBA experience, specifically in regards to high schools. Um, you'll see that we have $1.7 billion in high school OPM experience alone. Um, that's not including elementary schools, middle schools, any of that. That is specifically for high schools. Um, and the other one here is just um, our in-house capabilities. Um, right here we showcase our estimating capabilities. Uh, but we also have ske in-house schedulers, um, code reviewers. So ultimately, we're able to rely on our resources in-house and draw upon experts within our own company in order to help streamline our project. So 
I just want to call out those two things because I do think they were at the forefront and uh, a couple of the main reasons as to why Scan School was selected as your OPM and why we're the right fit for the project. Um, yeah, so just going through here at, at the bottom. Oh, sorry, I want to go back one more thing. Just show real quickly these example photos at the bottom here. Um, so Wakona Regional Vocational High School, that's a project that myself um, and my boss, John Benzinger, were involved with. Uh, we're completing that project right now. In the middle, you have Taconic High School. Uh, once again, John Benzinger and myself worked on that project, which we are just wrapping up the MSBA uh, audit right now. So that project is complete as well. Very excited for that. And then just all the way to the right, we have the Attleboro High School. And so once we were brought on board as OPM, our, one of our first tasks was to help the district uh, get through the designer selection process. And that can be a lengthy process. Um, there are a lot of it's a very prescribed process and with the state procurement laws and, and just the Massachusetts School Building Authority uh, designer selection process as it is, it's very rigid. We needed to do a lot of things to bring our designer on board. Uh, so this was months of work uh, and we worked very close with Gordon, with Steve, um, with Beth Margin Boucher. Um, just want to give a shout out. Joe Dunn as well. It's been fantastic to give us the time to get through that phase and to welcome these folks to our team. Um, so we, on April 5th, uh, completed the designer selection process with the Mass School Building Authority uh, when Jones Whitsitt Architects and Sims Maney McKee uh, were, as a joint venture, were um, selected for this project. And so this slide just has uh, the names of the key players on the design team. Uh, what you won't see here is the many sub-consultants of the design team, but these are the core players, your day-to-day -day folks, um, as we would say. And so we have Christian Whitsitt, who's in attendance tonight, the principal in charge. Dory Brooks, who you will be hearing from following my presentation. Dory's right here at the panel. Uh, Helen Fantini, project manager with Sims Mania McKee, helping out over here on the computer, making sure this doesn't go sideways. Um, and then Brian Black, I'm not sure Brian, we'll wave, and Molly Clark. And this is just a map of the state showcasing um, the different different projects that you'll see the yellow dots, which are uh, specific to Jones Whitsitt school projects that have been successfully completed in the state. And uh, the blue dots uh, are Sims Maney and McKee high school projects that they've completed throughout the state. And then it can be a little tough to decipher between the blue and the green here, uh, but the green dots are in fact projects where these two firms have worked together successfully on school projects, so. Okay, so you've heard me throw out the acronym MSBA a few times here, and for those of you who don't know, this is an MSBA project, um, and as your OPM, one of the, the main roles that we play is serving as a liaison between MSBA and, and your town. Um, MSBA is the state funding agency, and they're partnered with the town, so they're really a major, or, uh, sorry, a, a major project stakeholder, um, as we see it. And so the East Long Meadow Public School District has an opportunity to receive grant reimbursement from the MSBA to pay costs associated with a new school facility project. So very exciting. So where does that grant money come from? Actually, my buttons here. <laughs> Sorry about that. So MSBA grant money comes from you guys, all of us, the taxpayers in this commonwealth. Um, one penny of the state's 6.25% sales tax is actually committed to this program. And so with that pool of money, MSBA's board of directors is tasked with uh, divvying it up and uh, approving grants based on need and urgency. Um, as expressed by cities and towns throughout the state uh, through their statement of interest, which I will get into the specifics of what that document entails later. Um, and so once you're approved, um, you know, you're ready to go. And that's where you guys are at. It's, it's your turn now. Um, you can see the little bottom portion here. Your tax money has been being used across the state to fund awesome projects everywhere. We feel that now it's your turn. All right, so what are the initial requirements to receive grant from the uh, MSBA? So 
the biggest requirement that we're up against right now, um, we need to complete a comprehensive feasibility study uh, in collaboration with the MSBA to determine the most fiscally responsible and educationally appropriate long-term solution. I'll explain what that means in, in the coming slides. Um, the MSBA invited East Long Meadow to conduct a feasibility study on June 21st, 2021. So that's when the project really became a project. So why did MSBA feel the need to invite your town to conduct a feasibility study? Um, so as I alluded to, it all ties back to that statement of interest that the town submitted to MSBA to be considered for their program. And the statement of interest, or SOI, um, is a tool that the district uses to identify the deficiencies and the programmatic issues um, with the building, with this building specifically. And so all of the bullet points you see on this uh, list are actually extracted and pulled in from the statement of interest for this building that was eventually accepted by the MSBA. Um, and so we'll start at the top here. So most academic spaces within the building are below the standard guidelines developed by the Mass School Building Authority um, in conjunction with uh, DESE, the Department of Education and Secondary Education, of elementary and secondary education, sorry. Um, that said, the technology and special education areas are under current MSBA guidelines by more than 50%. And it goes unsaid, but that makes it incredibly challenging to meet the students' needs. Um, and that kind of just piggybacks into the next one. Undersized science labs are easily overcrowded. And given the nature of what happens in science rooms, what the kids are doing, that can be a safety concern. The library is inconveniently located on the second floor. It's antiquated, and it's, which ultimately prohib prohibits it from being what we call a proper 21st century learning environment. <clears throat> the electrical system. The electrical system and the HVAC system here are probably the biggest challenges on the building itself. Um, they're at capacity with the electrical system here, which disallows for additional air conditioning and technology improvements and expansion uh, throughout the building. And you know, that said, the transformer uh, for this building has, has been known to overheat. Due to the excessive loads, um, there's faulty wiring and equipment failures that all ultimately could lead to outages, which causes disruptions to the learning environment. <clears throat> As I said, HVAC system also an issue. Uh, it's original to the building. Uh, mechanical issues are very prevalent here and cause learning disruptions. The roof, as good as it's been, it's 29 years old, and uh, we're starting to notice some leaks in here. Last but not least, the old asbestos uh, tiling, uh, the floor tiling, is becoming worn down, which uh, I think goes unsaid, but presents a, another possible health hazard. And so given the magnitude of what I just listed out, and this really just scratches the surface, I, I urge you folks to take a look at the um, statement of interest, which we'll be explaining how you can find that later in the uh, presentation. But given the magnitude of all these inefficiencies of the building, uh, whether just in general, or what it means for the educators here, um, MSBA decided that something needed to be done. And that's ultimately when the statement of interest was accepted. You folks were invited to do a feasibility study. So what is a feasibility study? The feasibility study is the earliest and most critical part of the design process. This phase includes information gathering, investigation assessment of current conditions, Establishment of goals and objectives, definition of educational and community programming needs, and development of planning options. So continued on here. With that, the overall goals of the feasibility study, I mean, you can read them here. I'm not going to go through each one. But these are the goals that we are aiming to hit with our submission. And to achieve all these goals, Skanska and the design team uh, will be meeting very regularly and working closely with uh, the town and school representatives uh, to ensure that all of the deliverables that are incorporated into these uh, modules uh, get taken care of. Uh, we have already begun meeting with our senior leader leadership team meeting on a bi-weekly basis every other week um, just to go over action items and make sure that we are tracking towards our submission and I'm not going to be up against that. <clears throat> We've also begun um, the design team has begun the educational visioning and programming sessions. 
Um, they've had a few already and more to come this month, so uh, fast movement on that. And then also we have, uh, this Friday, we have our existing conditions survey, the first uh, one of, of those to take place. So you can see we're getting the ball rolling with all of these goals and making sure that we incorporate everything into our the feasibility study. And at the bottom here, you'll see the three options of the project that, will, that need to be considered under MSBA's guidelines. New construction, which is construction of a completely new school facility. Um, addition renovation, which would be ultimately utilizing uh, some of the existing building's components and, and building off of it. And then the renovation only, which is a, just a basic repair, um, you know, code upgrade to bring the whole building up to code. And so at a minimum, and to remain eligible for MSBA funding, that's the really important piece here, the project team needs to look into the potential for all three of these project options. And we'll be doing so throughout this feasibility uh, study. And MSBA being the major stakeholder that they are and having the state money tied into it, they really do look into everything. And during their review, they determine and deem whether or not you did a full comprehensive feasibility study. So we need to make sure that we're providing all of the content and uh, making that very clear for them. And so that said, our, uh, over the summer, our team will be looking into each of these project types and uh, in relation to the East Long Meadow High School project. All right, so this slide shows the progression through the first four modules of MSBA's process. In total, there are nine modules. Um, in the MSBA core project program, which is what this project is in. Um, we'll get to that, the full display of the modules in a few slides here. Um, it's a very prescribed process, I think, as I've, I've said before. So in order to move from one module to the next, we do need approval, and we need to make sure that we're satisfying all the requirements within each module. OK, so starting at the top here, we had the eligibility period, which is essentially um, where the MSBA reviewed the statement of interest and determined that something needed to be done. You got your invitation to the feasibility study, and the first step was to select an OPM. Thank goodness we are here. There, we then went to select a designer. So once we brought them on board, we then graduated to module three, that you are here that you're seeing right now. And so module three is the feasibility study. We have it broken up into two phases. The first that you will see right now, which we are in and tracking towards um, a submission this summer, is the preliminary design program. I'll get into some more of the specifics of what each of these modules um, entails on the next slide. And then from there, we'll later in the year um, go into the preferred schematic report. And then hopefully from there, we will go into module four, schematic design. <clears throat> And so with any project, we're always tasked with, you know, creating a schedule. And it can be very challenging up front because we don't understand the full scope of the project. We, we have all of these MSBA requirements that we need to take a look into all of the different options. And so we really don't have an indication of what this project is going to look at like right now. We're in the part where we are, you know, bringing in information from the town and looking into everything, but we just aren't at a point where we can set in stone all of these dates. So this is a tentative schedule, and just the disclaimer, dates are subject to change depending on the project type, the delivery method. Um, and then the other big thing here is that we haven't received the update from MSBA on when their board of directors meetings will be for next year. So some of the uh, later tasks you will see are just projected dates, which we'll need to go back and verify and, and uh, fix the schedule once we do know what those dates are. So that said, these first, uh, this slide here, the date should be pretty real because we know all the, the uh, board directors meeting dates for this year. So from May through August, that's when we are doing this PDP, the uh, Preliminary Design Program Development. And in there, you'll see existing conditions assessment, educational visioning, as I've uh, spoken about, uh, site options evaluation, and development of preliminary options. So from there, we are targeting August of this year for a submission date to MSBA. And then hopefully we're able to just then move right into the preferred schematic report development, which is a further development of uh, the options that I talked about and an analysis of uh, building systems, developing a preliminary budget, and evaluating and selecting the preferred options. So at the end of PSR, that's really where we're boiling it down. We've taken a look at all these different options. We're going to make a submission to the state and, and pinpoint which of those options we think is the most preferred for the, for the town. Um, <clears throat> so from there, 
we have this 21 day review period that is standard for MSBA. So they get the submission, they will review, make comments to us, and then we will respond accordingly. Um, and then we, you'll see at the end of this, we have MSB approval to schematic design for March of 2023. And then into, carries us over here from March until August of 2023, building out that schematic design submission. We're submitting, we, once again, these are tentative, but we're, we'd like to submit in August of 2023 for the schematic design package. And then there's another prescribed 21-day uh, review period. Um, where MSBA will be taking a look at the schematic design and ultimately we'll be getting towards what we call a project scope and budget agreement, which leads us into the next module, module five, which is funding the project. So once MSBA does approve our schematic design submission um, and we receive the project scope and budget agreement, we'll be at a point where we will ask the town to have a vote to fully appropriate the, um, the funding for the project. <clears throat> And this is just an overall schedule. So I know before I told you folks that there were there are nine uh, modules, and there are. We just haven't included them here. Um, there, uh, module number eight is the closeout module, so we didn't find that totally necessary to show you tonight. And then uh, module nine is a post-occupancy mo module, and that's really just kind of a data collection module where the MSBA, the state, comes back afterwards to ensure that your building was, you know, it's operating as designed essentially, that the energy savings are what they need to be, all that good stuff. So anyways, in feasibility module three, you see that you are here, um, tracking on down through. So I've already brought you up to speed through funding the project. So once the project is funded, uh, we have our everything in place. We'll get going on building out the design. Um, and then that leads us to construction, which right now we have tentatively from July 2024 through May 2027. And now I'd like to welcome back uh, Superintendent Gordon Smith and School Building Committee Chairman Steve Crucial to let you guys know how you can stay involved with the project and just stay up to date with us. Thanks, Ben. Uh, so starting tomorrow, we will be launching as a link from the district webpage a specific project area, ELHS building project area, where we can consistently update folks on new happenings. Uh, you can investigate and learn more about both our design team, our owner project manager team, uh, all the folks on the school building committee, and um, any updates or any information that you'd like to investigate, there'll be links to the Mass School Building Authority website. Um, and they have a wealth of information, not only on all of their modules as Ben described, but also, sorry, but also um, projects that they've accomplished and finished and projects that are ongoing. And so it gives you an incredible amount of information of how their processes work and how these projects move along through the different modules. At this point, as we, before we move into um, elements of the design phase. Are there questions that we can answer for anybody? Probably because we are such good teachers. That's why we are in education. So, right. if questions come to mind. I'm right here. At this point, I would like to introduce Dory Brooks from our design firm, Jones Witsit Architects. Thank you, Gordon. Um, Thank you so much for being out here tonight. This is uh, the beginning of a critically important process. And our job is to do our work with your input throughout from the beginning. Um, there are many design challenges ahead of us. We're, we're not going to talk about the specifics. I assure you that as we go through the specifics of, of designing the building, there's many details to assess. But tonight, tonight, we're talking about our big vision. Um, we will become a little bit more interactive here as we go along. Um, we're looking forward to getting your input because, uh, as I say, as designers, uh, we feed on your inspiration. Our job isn't to deliver a school for our community, but for your community. And it really needs to be shaped by your priorities. 
uh, I'm excited to be here on behalf of Jones Woodset Architects, and I'm excited that we are collaborating on this project with SMMA, our colleagues who we've worked with on four previous projects. Um, JWA has been working in the Valley for 35 years, producing schools and other uh, cultural facilities. Um, we have a great track record, and we are excited, most of all, to be working on schools. We care passionately about schools. Um, so to talk a little bit before we move into the design, I did want to say that your way of being involved, you know, this is a good crowd, but I, I hope we can build on it. Um, you would like, as, as we talked about those different modules, the way to interact with the project is to participate in these meetings as we have them, but also to remember that the school building committee will be weighing a lot of really big choices. So when the school building committee is having their uh, monthly meetings, you can participate online and observe what's going on. Um, we often find that the modules are structured by the MSBA in a way that often uh, communities um, get to the point of having to make a decision in a vote. And at that point, people engage. And at that point, a lot of other critical decisions have already been made by the committee. So encouraging everyone you know to participate is really helpful. We've already met with 30 teachers um, and done interviews. We're meeting with students. We hope to continue to do that. We'll continue to have public forums so you can be involved. So again, before we get into the, the nitty gritty of projects, it's important to step back and talk about what schools are. So I was doing a little research on this project and realized that this school's been here now for 62 years. Um, it was a mid-century design, um, post-war, baby boom era. Schools were popping up pretty quickly. Um, construction techniques had changed radically after the war. Um, what's not known by many people is often those types of schools weren't expected to last 50 years because it was a new technique of building quickly. Um, most schools of this era are uninsulated ribbon windows. Uh, as we mentioned, the existing systems here, many of them are 62 years old now. So the community invested uh, at that time an allocation of over $2 million for the original school. I'd say you got your money's worth. <laughs> it's done very, very well in 62 years. So the question today is, what kind of school do you want today? Because we have to anticipate that whatever we invest in here is going to be here for 62 years, if not longer, and hopefully it will be longer, because I'd say techniques have changed and we have higher expectations um, for the performance of buildings today than we did in 1958 when this project began. Um, in this visioning process, um, what we hope to do is to investigate your thoughts about several different issues. Um, first off, we want to talk about schools as places for learning. Uh, we know that it matters to you, the quality of the education that your, your, your children are getting, that students are getting, and that's, that's critically important. And David, Stephen will be leading us as we talk a little bit more about your vision for education. But additionally, we want to think about schools as places for community. We're interested in how the community can make use of this investment and this resource beyond just education, but also as a civic architecture. So in 1958, when this project was originally conceived, the community wanted a pool. The community agreed to have a pool. And that pool we hear today still really matters. So we've already heard that the community wants a pool. So that's one example of one of many different things the community may want to do with this building. And I think what we see as a trend in education is that schools are now being designed to last uh, all year long, to be operated all year long to be available as cooling shelters and warming shelters and as civic resources. So I think that's a vision that probably didn't fully exist in 1960, and we, we welcome your input on that idea. But we also want to think of schools as places for work. And I know that seems so obvious it's not worth mentioning, but the point there is to think about the people who are in the school every day. So when we interviewed 30 teachers recently, we found many of them had taught here for 20 to 30 years of their career cheating here. Um, so 20 to 30 years of their career, and some of them had actually gone to school here. So when you think about those individuals who've been here that long, that means that they've probably spent more hours in this building than in their own home. So as an environment, we want to care about the quality of the environment and its ability to support people, not just students, but also teachers, so that they can do their very best 
in their work, because they're also a huge investment of this community on an annual basis as you commit to, to the cost of operating school. So as a whole, again, we think of this then as a discussion about your shared values as a community and how the school reflects those values. We want to talk tonight a little bit about what your school's educational goals and teaching methods should be now and in the future, which is a hard stretch for a lot of people. Talking to teachers, none of them can fully conceive where we're going. Um, we know, for instance, that after the pandemic, technology has changed. Students' relationship to school has changed. So there's a lot of unknowns here, but we want to explore some of those knowns, uh, unknowns and knowns over the next month or two as we develop those educational goals. Um, we want to talk with you about health, and we'll share some information as the project proceeds about how daylighting and fresh air, um, outdoor learning and movement can help the cognitive performance of students and why that raises the standards for us as designers, but also to find out what your priorities are for the environment of the school. And the sustainability, whether you have a green agenda or not, the cost of energy is such that we all have to care about the energy loss and use of a school. And we have to think about how that school is going to perform again over 60 or more years. Um, so sustainability is a, a key topic that we encourage conversation about so that we can hear from you your priorities of, on this project as it goes over time. And then last, culture. You know, culture doesn't often get mentioned, but we're talking about an environment for adolescents. And the nature of that environment has impact on them socially and emotionally, intellectually, um, and in their development as people. Um, and it's an important topic to discuss as to what kind of environment we're creating, what, what's appropriate, what are teenagers looking for in an environment today. Um, we want you to know that you're not alone. <laughs> Many MSBA projects, uh, there's roughly 15 to 17 a year um, that are uh, ongoing for core projects. Um, and we know it takes a long time for a community to get queued up for a project like this. Um, but there's a lot to learn from other communities. And we thought it might be helpful tonight to share three projects, um, uh, two of which were designed by SMMA and one of which was not. Um, the point is simply we've selected these projects because they touch on themes that we heard in our discussions with teachers. So we think that there's some merit to looking at how other communities have addressed similar questions that you may be asking, similar priorities. Um, and also just to frankly help people to see what a new school looks like. Because for a lot of people, it's been a long time. You know, for the teachers here, it's been a long time. Um, so we've selected some schools that we think are, are going to be helpful to that conversation. So to start with, this is North Middlesex School. And in each of these, I'm going to share some plans and talk a little bit about what it is about this plan that we think may be relevant. So North Middlesex High School is a school for roughly 825 students, so similar in size to East Long Meadow. Um, their educational goals touch on many of the same themes that we've been hearing here, um, including the idea of uh, 21st century learning, encouraging uh, more hands-on learning, more interdisciplinary learning is a conversation that comes up on every project, um, talking about more student-centered learning. Uh, and what we liked about this plan uh, is that what you see in the very center there, I'm going to have to turn a little so that we get into this, you see pointing to the very middle of the plan is a central commons. So it's both a dining commons and a student social commons. And it becomes kind of the heart of the school that a lot of spaces look into. There's, it helps to create an identity for students to have a common area like that that can be lovely, but also can socially connect. This, oh, sorry. The circulation for this school is really a simple T. So that central commons connects to a, 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 a two-story um, corridor and at the ends of those corridors, there are those two academic pods. And the academic pods are uh, designed so that classes are in conjunction with each other. So rather than going down a long hallway, you're at the end of the hall, the beginning of the hall, there's a sense of connection between classrooms. That, we think, has greater opportunity for flexibility over time. It might be organized in an interdisciplinary way. It might be organized in a, in a disciplinary way. But you can have a variety of different types of classrooms, which encourages different types of learning. So larger studio spaces for hands-on learning, more traditional classrooms, smaller intervention spaces, all as a cluster or pod. Um, this school also has a very efficient organization overall. And that central commons, I love that it, it reaches out and creates an outdoor space. 
um, and that outdoor space we're going to take a little bit of a look at. Um, the arts wing is organized together as a special space. The school cared a great deal about that idea. And then the phys ed wing comes together as a single space. Um, this school did have a second story media center. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just it's a choice. Um, but it's a more multi-purpose media center updated today. Media centers are very flexible nowadays. It can be used in a variety of different ways. So that's always a, a point of conversation. Um, and then just to show you some images, that central common, that's what you see to the left there in the image. Um, that's just, again, the central spine of the school. It's higher two-story with that media center looking down into it with that stairwell that students can spend time on, socialize, gather at, that connects you to that central spine of circulation. The school included um, a student store, which was a part of a, a, a learning opportunity. Um, we find that um, what we're doing in schools all the time now is creating spaces for students to work independently. So now that we know that vast amounts of information is on the internet, and learning is less about memorization of fact. It's more about working with fact, working with information, doing analysis, collaborating, learning those skills that are going to help you in the workplace. It becomes necessary to create spaces for students to do that kind of work together. So um, you try and find spaces outside of classrooms to allow students to learn how to become independent workers, how to work together with each other, but still be safely monitored and observed by teachers. Um, and to be able to sort of, again, develop mature skills as learners. Um, we also find it helpful sometimes to create spaces where classes can work together. So this school chose to have a large group instruction room, which would allow multiple classrooms to meet at once. Um, and then, again, throughout the school, we, we found places in the school where you could find um, uh, natural lighting to support healthy environments for, for learning. This is a picture of the media center, which has a variety of different spaces within it. It's updated. Even then, frankly, I'd say we were already seeing sort of questions about how much technology in media centers because students have so much technology. So that's being debated, I think. But you see it, a general sense of comfort in the media center that allows students to work independently um, to learn how to research. Um, still, we find students want books. You know, <laughs> nobody's forgotten books. Um, but they tend to be about encouraging uh, a love of reading rather than necessarily providing all the research material students need. So this school also, similar to East Long Meadow, um, had an interest in outdoor educational spaces and in gardens outside of the school. So that at the end of that T, um, there was a lovely space and there were opportunities for outdoor classrooms so that students could take students outside. Um, we, we heard a lot about this from teachers, that the pandemic changed their relationship to the outdoors and they'd like to pursue that again. Um, moving on, West Springfield High School is a school that many of you know probably because you may have visited. We heard about this from uh, teachers here, which was nice. It's an SMMA project, so uh, we were familiar with it. Um, it has some of the same characteristics. Um, it is also a pod academic cluster approach um, where uh, classrooms are joined together. The difference is it was a much larger population, I think over 1,200 students. Um, which allowed them to do uh, different things with that pod. Um, in the center of one of those pods, there's actually a very large, um, it's sort of more like a mini auditorium uh, of, for 250 students. So that could really pull together a larger number of students. Um, but there was the same approach to interdisciplinary you know, opportunities, opportunities for collaboration by joining classrooms together in this way. Um, the, um, one of the things that's challenging on projects with the MSBA is the MSBA's contribution isn't uh, just uh, based on percentage of cost. It's actually specific. They have some spaces they're eager to support um, and some spaces they, they're not as willing to participate in the cost of. So the auditorium, a space like this that might support the entire school, is considered a, a less utilized space. It's often largely empty, even if you hold a class in here. Uh, so the MSBA actually only contributes to a fraction of the total um, population in an auditorium size. So in West Springfield, they actually took that available space, and instead of a, an auditorium for 1,200 students, they had an auditorium for 700 students, and then a mini auditorium for 250 students. And that financially made sense and made for higher utilization of those spaces. Um, this plan's interesting in that if you know uh, this site, there's a big hill. So the building kind of bends to accommodate the hill. 
And that student commons that we saw in the other school is actually created around a courtyard, which creates an outdoor space in front of the school um, that allows students to eat and then go outside or gather in front of the school. So it's a really nice space. Um, the, the gymnasium is exceptional there. Um, but this school also chose to have a community pool, so we wanted to share that idea. Um, the MSBA does not participate in the cost of that, um, but if the community wants it and is willing to, to, to include the cost of it, then that's an acceptable idea. Um, so here's some images from that. So that it was a six-lane community pool. On the left, you see the cafeteria entry courtyard sequence that, again, creates an outdoor space. It's a site that's off the road far enough that that idea of a social space in front of the school is comfortable, but every site's different and every community has to address site, con stack, um, site constraints separately. Um, again, here's a media center that actually looks down um, from the second floor to the first floor, but is centrally located and is even more kind of open um, to the circulation spine and creates even more variety of spaces. Um, and then you have that cafeteria commons, which is also, again, tied to circulation in some ways. Um, in terms of classroom types, I think what we see and expect to see here are more variety of types of classrooms. Larger classrooms to support project-based, hands-on learning, STEAM, um, you know, STEM and arts learning, uh, hopefully bringing those ideas together a little bit more than currently exists at the school, but also a variety of classroom sizes to support students who have different uh, learning styles and needs. You know, there's uh, uh, a need for students who, who need um, um, significant care in the school, and they have specific needs. The idea would be to be sure the environment is comfortable for all students. Like currently uh, at East Long Meadow High School, there's air conditioning only in certain spaces based on students who have the highest um, physical need. Um, that would be something that obviously would be able to address in a new school. Um, this is Mount Greylock High School. This is a different type of plan. What we find interesting about it uh, is this is a renovation. The other two schools I showed were new. Um, uh, Mount Greylock's a district that's actually had declining population. So uh, they wanted to keep the larger public spaces that they had, the cafeteria and, I'm uh, sorry, the auditorium and the, gym, and the gymnasium. Um, under the MSBA rules, those spaces might have been smaller in new construction. And they were of such value that they, they chose to design around it. They found it to be cost beneficial. Um, the school actually is similar in age to this. Um, the classrooms, similar to East Long Meadow High School, were, were really not accommodating current size guidelines or, or needs. But it was a large site. So they could keep students in the classrooms while building a new academic wing. And they chose to build a pretty efficient three-story academic wing um, which looks essentially like a double-loaded corridor, sort of a traditional approach. But even within that, they were, made that corridor flexible, created some space within the corridor to allow that sort of student-centered learning, and created a variety of different spaces within it. And then most importantly, I think, they, they really focused on that idea of, of encouraging teachers to work together by putting um, all of the disciplines on each floor. So there's two science labs on each floor and other classes around them, and a, a mixture of small and large spaces to encourage that same kind of dynamic energy that you see in the pod approach but with a little bit more daylighting on both sides. Um, again, restoring fully the, the gymnasium and auditorium, and then they added a media center and cafeteria in front of the school. So a renovation always creates constraints. There's always things you have to give up, um, but it is often possible to do something like that. Um, this is just a, a model to show you, and what you can see here is that curve at the front, and then the, the three-story wing, that's all of the new construction. Those popped up roofs are the old construction, and the old classrooms were kind of courtyard based um, program that was behind those volumes. Some of these spaces, just to give you a sense of what mattered, it really did change the whole entry experience to put that new facade and new volumes in front of the school so that you didn't even know to some degree that it wasn't a new school. Um, the entry is, is more open, connects to the cafeteria, creates some of that student-centered social space. Um, I think students at Greylock tend to wait at the school to be picked up, it's, so there's a, a little bit more of a waiting area that was decided that was needed. Um, the classrooms are not uh, enormous uh, as classrooms go. They're sort of in the, the smaller size today, um, for, but still larger than most of the classrooms that we find here. 
Um, and their classrooms are designed around flexibility, so lighter weight furniture that allows teachers to reorganize the classroom more easily um, to, again, encourage group work and project work and diversity of learning experiences. Um, again, these are the two spaces that they chose to keep and fully restore. So um, I did go in that auditorium before this was renovated, and it looked nothing like that. So we do want to reassure you that should renovation be an option here, um, it can be a transformative experience as much as a new, new construction is. So those are just some ideas to give you a sense of where things can go. Um, certainly not in any way a catalog to pick from. <laughs> Um, we really, really want to be sure that we design this school around this community's needs. So what we'd like to do now, and David will help be sure I get this right, is we'd like to have an interactive moment here by asking you to bring out your phones. We're going to ask you to weigh in on your priorities for the architecture of the project. And the way to do that is to either directly go to www.menti.com and then enter in the number 28805158 or hold up your camera and just shoot at that um, QR code to bring up the, the page. And when you do, hit the heart to let us know that you're there. And we're assuming, by the way, that there's also people at home. And people at home can also do that. You can just open a browser page and do the same thing. I'm seeing lots of activity. Great. No, not you. I mean, good act. <laughs> yeah, yeah. OK. All right, looks like we have some people here. All right, so now I'm going to switch here and share this list. These are some of the architectural priorities that were shared by the district with us when we began the project. Some of these ideas also came from faculty that we interviewed. Uh, what we heard is a desire for hands-on and career technical education. That's always a discussion. Uh, you know, where, where are jobs going? Where are careers going? Um, flexible learning venues, more flexibility in general. Um, updated science classroom is a critical issue here. Updated performance in music spaces, a student commons, space for collaboration, passive and active safety measures, community connections, a better media center, and healthy and sustainable environment. So those are some priorities that we've, we've heard. There are certainly others. Um, now we'd like to ask you to type in your architectural priorities so we can capture some of your thinking. And what will happen is those will magically pop up here. <laughs> and we'll be able to capture that and share that with the school building committee. Uh, and uh, we'll sit here and quietly wait <laughs> while you try and enter, enter some thoughts. And we're, we're truly interested in your ideas. School safety. Um, certainly, it's on everyone's mind right now. Um, automatically safety is a priority for every project and the standards are entirely different than what were in place in 1960. Um, STEM labs, um, safe, innovative, open, collaborative spaces, um, a new pool with six lanes, accessibility for disabled students, a community-based building, and that's, that's the $10,000 question. How do we define exactly what that means? We'll look forward to talking more about that. Um, flexibility, sustainability, and security. That's a very clear list. I think that really hits some very good priorities. Space for students to move about during learning, interactive labs, and outdoor space. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, Steam-friendly classrooms. Um, arts. It's interesting how um, arts is, is something that we take for granted, but it, it really has that um, psychological benefit for students. So it's always good to see arts return as a conversation in schools. Spaces for preparing students for more than pursuing higher education, as there are plenty of other options in life. Certainly that's true. And I think that there's just a whole mix of, I mean, you know, looking at, at what folks in the trades are able to, to make, we certainly know that there's many ways to, to have a, a vibrant, successful life. Um, community use, specifically a new eight-lane pool. So we'll have to decide about those extra two lanes. Outdoor learning space. More cohesive and robust mental health facilities, counseling given current mental health crisis, updated labs, open space for learning, for um, didactic hands-on learning, outdoor learning, softball fields. Oh, yes, the softball fields are not on the site. 
we will certainly talk about that. Accessibility for students and facility, new pool security, STEM, career tech, sounds like we're, we're hitting um, some themes repeatedly. Um, flexible learning environments, music and art space, student commons collaboration, space for teachers, new paras. That's great to, oh no, new pool. A sustainable and flexible um, community center, radio, TV, film, podcast. LCAT is an amazing resource. I'm truly impressed by what students are able to access. Um, so uh, we, we're excited to, to look at that possibility. Um, outdoor spaces, a building that can take care, that will be taken care of, um, a community use, school safety, community-based addresses that look and feel of East Longmeadow. Oh, that addresses the look and feel of East Longmeadow. So I think that's a question of, are we going to make a school that sticks out or a school that relates in, uh, to architecturally to the community? And that's always a, an interesting discussion. Beautiful, welcoming, comfortable, a place anyone would love to be. Secure and sustainable, proper ventilation, yes. Um, ability to continue in-person teaching even if social distance is required. That's a really thoughtful idea. Um, we don't really know uh, whether or not we're facing more pandemics. So that's an interesting, interesting idea. I'd like to see investment in STEM spaces and increased use of technology, flexible spaces for classes to perhaps join for collaboration, enhanced athletic facilities, investment in art, theater, music, more space for academic support, accessible classrooms, safe spaces for all kids of every ability. So I hope I, I read them all and didn't miss any. So before I depart, I'd like if we could also talk about what it means to be a community project um, and talk a little bit about the district's community priorities for the building. So we've heard about the need for a community room. The meeting room we regularly meet at seems to get a lot of uh, use. <laughs> so uh, community space um, in terms of meeting rooms, space for community partners, um, places where the senior center can meet, uh, where LCAT can continue to operate and where the rec uh, programs can operate. Um, outdoor space for student learning, potential district central office space that's currently here. Um, sadly, many of these um, goals are, are not reimbursed by the MSBA, but they are critical to the functioning of the district, so they will be talked about. Um, and then athletic spaces, a plan that lends itself to sharing the facilities with the recreation program. More than any project we've ever worked on, the level of recreational use of the site is amazing. Um, and we know that that's a high priority. So we'd like to know what we missed, what we haven't heard, what other ideas should be brought to the table for discussion. I know that someone in the eighth row is working, so I'm, I'm going to wait. <laughs> um, safe sheltering heating cooling center. Yeah, that's one of the things that we, we, we do hear more and more that, uh, you know, again, 1960, nobody was thinking about an air-conditioned school, but, um, but cooling has become almost a, a vital concern to many communities, um, and a heating shelter as well in the, summer, in the winter. A bathroom available for athletic events. Um, yes, yeah, so we understand that the, the new um, game field needs um, some support um, still, and that that was on the plan, so we'll be able to address that, we hope. Um, limit access roads to the school campus, um, direct traffic away from residential neighborhoods, and keep access points to main roads. That's a really interesting point. It's the first we've heard of that. We, do, we, ha we are looking at that, so I think it's, uh, it's helpful to hear that concern. Um, Accessing a site and allowing different parking areas and different uses is challenging. Um, it's a great site, but it is sort of in the middle. <laughs> um, a large enough meeting room for all public open meetings and potential alternative um, voting and polling site. Updates on the site, athletic facilities. Yes, so the fields probably not had that investment in a long time. Some of the practice fields and game, smaller game fields. So that would be something to look at. I'm concerned about what systems can be incorporated for school safety. Um, I assure you that uh, there's a, a safety consultant on the team. Um, the whole mechanisms for entry of the school are very different. 
um, there's quite a lot of technology. We'll, we'll be sure to have and share public information about those ideas. Other community rooms, space available, community theater, senior center, adult education, apprenticeships programs to help build a sense of community and buy-in from the community. Um, enhanced sports facilities that properly provide for all students. So that suggests that there's um, potentially either an accessibility issue or perhaps a sense of marginalization for those who can't be on site. Um, community food pantry, mental health services, um, introducing a farm to table option for food. Culinary programs can help expose kids to new foods and culture. Charging stations for electric cars. We know that Springfield has an amazing uh, uh, food project, uh, really a, a national model. So it'd be interesting to learn more about its relevance here. Um, so charging stations for electric cars that are going to be required by code now. So we'll be able to accomplish that. Um, a teen center space for kids to be together safely outside of school hours. I think that really is a great thought and gets at that question about is education really uh, confined to a very narrow window of time or is that going to change over time? Cost effective pillar of community or central location for gathering activities of all sorts. Bring the outdoor in, parking. Room for outdoor basketball courts on campus. Safety of vehicles entering the school property. Access from main road only. Community access to gym, co-ed sports for adults and teens separately after school hours. That's, again, one of the advantages here is we can design for that community use in a way that um, that is more secure, and protective of the educational spaces, and also supportive of the community. Energy efficient, um, limit carbon footprint, skate park, um, uh, year-round athletic fields for all ages and abilities, provide curriculum and facilities that enhance 21st century technologies, being sure to keep all access to new building, athletic fields, or facilities. Building is limited to Maple Street, but excludes um, Barry and Norden Streets, we're simply looking out for the safety of the young children in that neighborhood. So thank you for bringing those comments and thoughts. Uh, I'm going to ask David Stephen to join us, and David is going to um, take you through the, the fun educational part of our conversation tonight. Thank you very much for your time, and we'll continue to update you and be involved with you um, throughout the project. Maybe take a few questions before we move on. And we're, we've also built in time at the end for Q&A. So. Great. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is David Stephen. I'm what's called the educational programmer as part of the design team. I have a background as both a licensed architect, but um, more importantly, I've spent about 20 years uh, as a teacher uh, working in and with schools in the K-12 arena around across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So my role in the project is to work with stakeholders such as the community and teachers and parents and students and the design team um, to talk about this connection between a forward-thinking vision about what, um, what the district would like to see to make the most use of this opportunity educationally and what that can look like architecturally as well. So we're, we're really trying to push people's thinking forward about what's possible, but it's very much um, a, a process of listening and, um, and trying to understand uh, and get to know as much as possible about the district and, and your needs. Um, so I'm gonna do a quick overview of what the visioning entails, and then I'm gonna talk about some of the educational focus areas that we, uh, that we like to uh, uh, kind of share with people and get feedback on. And we're going to be asking for your feedback as well. Um, so this visioning process involves multiple stakeholders. We've met with the educational leadership team from the district. Um, we've, has been said, we've had some, we've had one workshop and we have two more workshops coming up with what we call the educational working group. We have a group of about 20 um, administrators and teachers from the school uh, that are, are, are looking at sort of crafting the educational vision and priorities uh, for the school. And we're going to connect that to design priorities um, and, um, and possibilities. And we have these community forums. So all of the information that we collect in the visioning process, we're going to be putting together as a set of consolidated notes with all the highlights, making them available to the community uh, through the project website uh, to keep the process really transparent. And it's an ongoing conversation. So there's always 
there's time to add ideas as you see sort of what people are thinking. And if you have questions or if you have more things that you'd like to add, um, you can certainly do that. Now, this all connects also to the MSBA, as we've heard, um, is your funding partner. They have a very thoughtful template of spaces. It really is a state agency, unlike any other state uh, in the US that is being very thoughtful about how they're funding schools. They want to make sure that people are designing schools that support what they do now, but that will also evolve and be flexible enough um, to adapt to use over the next 50 years, because we're looking at this as a 50-year building. And we've seen how much has changed just over the last 20 years in terms of kind of technology that is used in schools. So we need to be thinking future forward about that, and that's a lot what this process is about. Connected to it, we also have an educational plan that the district is writing. And that connects to the language that we're putting together, the narrative that we're putting together through the priorities that are established in visioning. And so this, again, is about developing a narrative that starts with your educational goals, because that really is the foundation for everything. Um, but we're also talking about design priorities and possibilities. We're looking at the MSBA template and thinking about adjacencies between spaces and how to get maximum benefit um, from this opportunity. I'd like to tell everybody that any new or renovated uh, school through the MSBA process will have a bunch of different qualities. Many of us who work in schools know that if we're in older buildings, there are certain kind of basic things that we'd like to have fixed. Um, so any new or renovated school in the MSBA process will be fully ADA compliant. And beyond that, it will be thinking about universal design and making the school really easy to use and navigate through. We're going to be thinking about safety and security features, both passive and active. We need to be thinking about thermal comfort. And as Dory said, we're looking at schools being used 24-7 uh, and throughout the year. So we, we need to have cooling as well as heating. This comes along with modern technology and furniture. And furniture is a big part of how we make school environments and learning environments more flexible and adaptable. And we're looking at classrooms being well-sized. To have an agile classroom, we need to make them a bit bigger than they've been in the past. because. Not only are they supporting traditional delivery, they also may be supporting small group work or project-based work, and they need to change throughout the day. Other things that we're thinking about that have already been mentioned a bit are indoor-outdoor connectivity. We want to maximize uh, the use of the site and really find ways to connect easily and safely to the outdoors. We have to think about special education delivery. And, um, and how we can make sure that, um, that there are small group areas and areas within the classroom where more individualized work can take place in close proximity or within the context of general classrooms. We have to think about safe drop off and pick up and making sure that we're separating uh, vehicular and bus routes and also pedestrian access. Any new or renovated building has some pretty high bars in terms of sustainability that we need to be thinking about in terms of making sure uh, that the building is sustainable. And finally, we'll be thinking about an adequate number of bathrooms located throughout the school and gender neutral bathrooms as well. So these are just some of the big picture things that any new or renovated school will have. So in this process, we really try and encourage people to be aspirational because this is the time we're looking at the 10,000 foot view of what is possible here. Um, and um, some of the overarching themes that we see coming up also as we think about 21st century schools is we're extending learning beyond the classroom. The classroom is still the basic building block for sure, but we want to use every square inch of the building. It's going to be fully wired with a robust technology infrastructure that can evolve uh, with new technology over time. So we want to also think about creating flexible and multi-use spaces, so big ticket spaces like your library media commons, your cafeteria, your auditorium, your, your gymnasium might have multiple uses throughout the day. Um, and we also want to build synergy and connectivity um, within the school so we can think about creating uh, kind of classroom neighborhoods that have a variety of spaces and opportunities for teaching and learning within them. And that also create a sense of small learning communities that kids really feel and teachers feel give them a sense of ownership and belonging. 
And we want to be supporting hands-on learning. That's a theme that comes up a lot now. When we think about 21st century skills, it's a lot about applying content in real world ways and doing problem solving that is meaningful to students. Um, and finally, we want to look at this as a community resource that can be used after hours and on weekends. And we'll have certain areas that can be blocked off from the rest of the building so that, um, so that use can happen safely and efficiently. So this is, again, is an opportunity to really look at, uh, closely at, this, at the district needs, the school needs, think about what's possible, and, and imagine a building that's going to support you for decades to come. So some of the themes that come up in Future Ready Learning, and I'm going to review some of them now quickly, and then ask for, for your feedback about what's most important to you. Um, when we think about 21st century skills, um, there's certainly the six R's, which we've been thinking about for a long time, have to do with mastery of core content, academic content, and reading, writing, and arithmetic. And that's very much the umbrella or the foundation for what we're doing in schools. But we also think about the five C's. And the five C's are higher order thinking skills. They're nothing new. They're not just 21st century. But they become particularly relevant because um, when we think about um, giving students the, the confidence to be proactive learners, to be adaptable learners, and um, which they will need both in the workplace and in higher education. Um, it's, this is the opportunity to apply uh, sort of content and learn critical thinking, communication, collaboration, creativity, and good citizenship. And this all, again, connects to the idea of potentially more hands-on and problem and project-based learning. STEM and STEAM is a theme that comes up a lot. Um, and finally, uh, social-emotional learning. Now, social-emotional learning is something that a lot of educators are, are, are talking about, of course, because we know that um, students come to school with a lot of different needs. And we want to make sure that we're meeting them where they're at, that we are engaging them in a community that feels supportive, where they feel known well by a number of adults. And, um, and where they can feel connected to other students. So uh, those are some of the big picture themes. And so we're looking at um, environments that are more kind of active and what we call student-centric, flexible, of course. We're assuming that every student is going to have at least one device, maybe two or three. And, but that, should just, that shouldn't be an end in and of itself. It's a tool that should be there when you need it um, for what you need it uh, for. And we're looking at collaborative environments as well as project-based environments. And we have to support traditional delivery as well. So in addition to collaborative environments, we need places where kids can get really focused and teachers can get really focused. So we need to think about very active and also very focused environments. So it's all about variety and building in the flexibility. This isn't just a nice idea. This is very connected to workforce development, um, whether, again, it's it's um, going into the world of work or into the world of higher ed, um, the top 10 skills that the World Economic Forum is saying that students need all connect to these five C's. And the five C's, I should say, also are very much connected to things like the next gen MCAS tests, really look for those higher order thinking skills. So, um, and one of the uh, most important ones is resilience and adaptability and the ability to persevere. Um, against challenges. So these are all, you know, it's a, it's a tall order, but these are the things that teachers are thinking about. Um, when we talk to your leadership team um, uh, initially about what's most important to them here at East Long Meadow High School, um, these are the top 12 uh, themes that came up. And I'm going to go through them quickly, and then I'm going to ask for uh, community feedback on what's most important to you. So the first was, and I'm, I'm showing them in order of how they came out in terms of priority, priorities for the district. Uh, and this was just from an initial conversation. Many of these are connected. Uh, universal design for learning connects the idea of meeting kids where they're at, understanding that all students have different learning styles, and that we want to give them different opportunities for representing, expressing, and engaging with the content that they are learning at school. So that means that we want hands-on as well as heads-on activities. And what that might mean also is that we need flexible environments with good storage. And uh, good storage comes up as, as number one on teachers' lists of the things that are, are, are very important to them. 
differentiated instruction, which is connected to this. We need to provide areas for targeted intervention and enrichment uh, where students can uh, have more personalized learning um, and self-paced, maybe small group work. And this connects to the idea of being inclusive and providing equitable access. Now, student-centered learning um, connects to the idea of agency, which is really students feeling confident and independent in their ability to learn. And that, I think, is probably one of the biggest differences between how educators are thinking about, um, about curriculum and school these days, is that we're trying to give students the tools to be more active, proactive learners, as opposed to just feeding them information. Now, there's a time and place for that kind of delivery, but we also want students to interact with the content that they're learning, develop their communication and organization skills, and their confidence in themselves. Um, as learners and as doers. Social emotional learning, um, I mentioned that before and that connects a lot to students learning, becoming more self-aware, um, developing responsible decision making and uh, feeling a part of a group developing their relationship skills. Growth mindset is something that a lot of educators talk about. The, the basic premise is that um, value over, of effort over just innate intelligence. Not just being good at something at the beginning, and that's why you do it, but um, if you work hard at something, you're gonna get better at it. So this also means you're celebrating um, challenge and failure sometimes, which is, which is um, and process. Uh, so that, that's a big part of um, uh, what's important for the district as well. Real world connections. This has to do with making the school walls um, permeable in the sense that you're inviting the community in safely. You're inviting students out into the community. The community becomes the text because we know that what is most engaging for students is doing things that feel real and meaningful for them, um, especially high school students. Um, and so this also connects to leveraging the resources of the community, adult professionals, um, community partners, and creating opportunities for students to interact with the adult world that they're about to enter. Now, mastery of core academics is also, as we said, the umbrella or the foundation for all of this. Um, and this is very important to your district as well. Um, but we also need to be thinking, um, as M Next Gen MCAS does, about students really kind of using those higher order thinking skills in the context, for instance, of literacy. Um, there's a big emphasis on reading and writing across the curriculum and reading all sorts of different kinds of things like technology manuals and writing things that, that connect to real life situations. Math is the same way, looking at conceptual um, sort of application and understanding of math skills. So those are the top 10 themes that, um, that were uh, prioritized by uh, the district in our initial conversation. And what I have, I have them listed here and I've actually added two things here that I didn't talk about but have been mentioned. Um, one of them is, uh, is dual enrollment and um, connecting to higher ed. Um, and if you go to your mentee, it's gonna read, you're gonna see these bigger than you can see them now. But thank you for enlarging them, Don. Um, so, and the other one is STEM and STEAM, which we've heard mentioned now. Uh, STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. And when you add the A in STEAM, that's art or some people think of it as art and humanity. So it's really taking a more integrated approach um, to, uh, to learning each of those different disciplines in a, in a project-based type of way. So with that, um, if you go to, um, and I, I think, is, is everybody um, there at, at Mentee? We're okay, we don't need to see the instructions again. Um, so you should have this on your screen and if you would just give us your feedback um, to prioritize, you don't need to do every single one, but if you give us your, your top uh, five or six, uh, we're gonna start to see a graph, but, or, or you could choose to prioritize all of them. And this is something that we do in our workshops, and it's always a really interesting way um, to then see what's rising to the top in terms of people's priorities and also then have a deeper conversation about what that really means in the context of the teaching and learning that goes on in the school.
we'll just um, wait if another minute or so. See how this populates. I can see stem and steam rising to the top there. All right. The other things that I can see at the top here are um, very similar to what your what your leadership team, your district leadership team, prioritized in terms of student-centered learning, universal design, um, differentiated instruction, social emotional learning, growth mindset. It's almost it's actually almost identical to the order that they had placed that in. And that's not to say that all of these aren't important, and they all connect the, uh, to the idea of flexible learning environments. And what's important to you now is going to evolve and change. So um, that's another theme in terms of uh, when we look at designing buildings. We don't want to be trendy. We want to be really practical and efficient about how we look at a building that is, can really evolve and grow um, along with a school over, over the coming decades. Great, so I still see that, um, and I'll leave this up for another minute or so as people might still be working on it, but um, again, the biggest difference there is that STEM and STEAM kind of rose, rose to the top of that pile. And STEM and STEAM, I think a lot of people are really interested in it, and I will say that the MSBA template of spaces has STE, uh, science, technology, engineering spaces uh, that are part of, of the template of spaces. Um, and I think this is in part uh, a reaction to the fact that about 20 years ago, um, we started kind of doing away with wood shops and, and, and home, home ec and and life skills spaces. And so a lot of schools are really like aching for having those more hands-on spaces. Now there's a big connection between that and the kind of next generation science skills and engineering um, that, that um, a lot of schools are really interested in and, and students as well. Okay, I'm gonna move on. And again, I, I, will, I would like to reiterate that all of the, um, the feedback that we're getting here is going to become part of the consolidated notes when we look at the themes that are emerging um, from, from both community feedback, we'll be doing with the, this with the faculty as well, and uh, within the context of our, our visioning workshops. So um, I'm gonna give you one more chance to kind of talk about your educational priorities in a little bit more detail. Um, and first I'll share uh, some of the, the district educational priorities. Um, uh, we talked about student-centered learning and how that connects to these critical thinking, problem solving, and kind of designing solutions for things. Um, also of, uh, of real priority for the district is maintaining your rigorous and rich curriculum and continuing to support a range of unique elective programs outside of the core programs that really connects to the idea of whole child approach that we're not just about academics, we're about all the enrichment opportunities, the arts and, and the athletics um, and, um, and, and uh, applied sciences. Um, diversity and inclusion, also co-teaching and utilizing universal design for learning so that all students access grade level skills together by removing barriers to access curriculum. And how that connects to, to, um, to the design of schools is that we're really thinking about classrooms not only being occupied by one teacher, they're often occupied by multiple adults who might be working with different groups of students. And we wanna provide ways that teachers can easily co-teach and collaborate with each other. So we wanna be thinking about the connectivity between their classroom. So with that, I'm gonna open up for people to give us feedback about more specific educational uh, priorities that you have as you think about the needs of uh, the students of the community, um, of your children, uh, your grandchildren, um, and, and what you would really like to see um, the school emphasize and support.
Joe's theme again as an emerging theme, um, vocational learning, specifically culinary arts, auto body, child care, uh, beautician, electrician, and plumbing. Um, balancing traditional academics with existing programs like culinary arts, uh, along with new programs uh, relevant to life after, after high school. Um, foreign languages, STEAM, and the trades. Inclusive and hands-on learning opportunities. And I will say that um, there's, there's uh, a lot of talk about maker spaces. Uh, the, the kind of spaces that support STEAM learning are called, often called maker spaces, where you might have 3D printers and you have CAD, three-dimensional design, computers and things like that. And we're also taking an approach to think about classrooms as maker classrooms. And that just means that they need to have flexible furniture, good technology, maybe a sink in the classroom, good storage, and they need to be large enough to be arranged in different ways so that that kind of hands-on approach can happen not only in the context of a, of a vocational um, or a technical uh, lab. Offering multiple ways uh, to learn and access curriculum based on individual learning styles, inclusive but not limited students, uh, not limited to students with special needs. Uh, emphasizing real world application, whether in STEAM, vocational, and the arts. Inclusion availability um, in all classrooms, college prep. Um, student centered learning, SEL, real world connection in classrooms. Prioritizing proactive, positive mental health. Arts, STEAM, and the trades. And I will say again with the mental health that we're really thinking about schools as communities where not only as uh, community centers for your larger community, but within the context of the school, students feel maybe connections to smaller orbits within the building during different parts of the day. They also feel connections to the larger whole. We like to think of a heart of the school and places where the life and culture of the school can really take root. Arts, STEAM, and the trades. Understanding and application of knowledge and hands-on learning applications, job skills, social skills, outside of technology, joy for learning, I would like to hear that, and curiosity and interest in learning. Opportunities for students to learn life skills for independent living post high school, and preparing students to compete in a global space that is increasingly being challenged by other countries such as China. Uh, and that connects a lot to those 21st century skills that we're that we like to focus on, providing guidance to career paths beyond high school, trade, and university uh, with equal emphasis. Okay. That brings us to 725. Uh, you've been listening to us patiently for a long time. Uh, shall we open up for five minutes of Q&A? If there are questions that people have here. versus what they might need in the future that we may or may not be able to anticipate. Take a quick stab at that, and then I'll open up for, for Dory or Helen if you want to. Um, I think it's really around that issue of trying to see beyond what's familiar. I mean, it, you know, we all have a sense, a st very strong sense of what school is if we've, if we've gone to school or if we've worked in a school for a long time. And even for kids, it's hard to imagine something different. And I think the biggest, the biggest challenge is to imagine students working more independently. That, so one of the things that we talk about is in using every square inch of a school is kind of exploding that idea of a hallway, which is a very, you know, it's a huge square footage sink and it's wasted space. So why not expand it in certain areas and put some furniture out there? Because we often see kids out there anyway working. Um, but that implies that they might, if we put a window between a classroom and that space, then teachers can be observing them, but not, they're not like right next to them. So there's that idea of control and students developing more independence and individuality within, you know, kind of their own process of learning. And I think that, so, so building in those type of spaces, being able to imagine that your students might, might be and probably should be learning more independently and will need to be learning more independently over time. And spaces that support that 
even if you may not use them now. So I would say that's one of the biggest ones. No? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd say that one of the things that you see a lot in these processes is that communities, uh, people can become very entrenched in their own position and unwilling to compromise on that. Um, and it really does have to be a community commitment to working through disagreement. Um, and I think part of why we wanted to share our experience and show other projects is to reassure you that the process of the MSBA and the, the professionals who are involved, we're, we're not going to completely misdirect here. You know, we're, you know, so it's good to be confident that you will come away with a very, very good school such that you don't necessarily have to dig in your heels on every single issue. Like that's a long list of things that some things will not happen. Some things you'll have to compromise on. Um, but it's, it's very hard to see communities fall apart over a project because people become convinced in that one moment that it has to be a certain way. When in reality, um, teachers are going to change, schools are going to change, students' needs are going to change. And we are looking down the road, not just at today's interests. And we'll be very careful to do that. Flexibility is the word that we hear um, from um, educational experts as being the most important thing to be thinking about because you want the school to last. And that doesn't mean an open school plan, you know, like the 1970s when flexibility meant no walls. <laughs> it often means um, a variety of spaces that you can adapt over time and, and, and reorganize. And that, that I think is really critical. So better to think about the big picture issues than to become um, overly committed to, to one idea that you can't give up. You mentioned the open school plan. I will say another thing that uh, I see that not a mistake that schools make, but it's just a, an important part of the conversation is how do we build in connectivity within the school environment um, without, an open, without an open plan necessarily, but visual connectivity through some transparency in key places. And that creates a sense of community. It creates a sense of vibrancy. You can showcase interesting things that are going on in the school. Um, one of the biggest complaints that teachers have is how isolated they are, and yet sometimes it's hard to convince folks that that's not the model that we should continue, a double-loaded corridor with classrooms where you close the door and you can't see into them. And for some people, it's around the idea of safety, and of course, that's an that's a incredibly important thing, but uh, ironically, a big part of the defensible space and design is to have good sight lines and to have connectivity so there's not the anonymity that comes from just a, an impersonal hallway with, with classrooms with closed doors. So that kind of connectivity, which, which really breeds kind of a vibrant and, 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 and joyful uh, learning, learning space is something that we, we want to share ideas about and push people's thinking on. Uh. No, I am muted. Okay. No. <laughs> Should I do it from here? Um, that is much better. As part of the evaluation process, what is needed to push for a new high school versus renovation versus renovation addition? What are the key factors to different, differentiate which type of project is submitted to the state? So I can, I can start this one. Uh, we have to explore each of these. In this early phase, the PDP, Preliminary Design Program, we have to explore just a renovation to code, addition renovation, and new building to, sh to demonstrate that we've looked at all of them. Um, but once we get through this initial phase, you're going to start to narrow down your options. And choices will become clear based on factors that we use with you to evaluate which is the best way to go. Some of that's gonna be cost, some of it is gonna be, does it respond the best to my educational plan? Um, does it respond the best to the community needs? So those things are all gonna kind of come into play as we move through this process together. I don't know if anyone else wants to jump on. But, uh, so by the way, that's Helen Fontini. She's a project manager for us and will keep us all on task and do a great job of that. So I don't think we fully introduced her there. Uh, the other thing I'd say that's important to know is that 
uh, it's actually the community's decision. The MSBA doesn't get to pick. Um, it, it will be what you decide as a community you want to submit, and the school building committee will be the responsible party making that final decision based on, again, as Helen said, on these factors that the, that the committee and the community will decide on. Um, cost is a, a part of that. Um, uh, but it isn't necessarily that you would choose to go with the lowest cost option, which potentially could be renovation. The other thing I think that we often want to tell people at this stage of the game is that the MSBA also asks that we help the community understand what the cost of doing nothing is. So we'll do an assessment of the building with all of our consultants to look at the cost of bringing this building up and living with it. Because when people start to say these projects are expensive, they're overlooking the fact that you're going to continue to repair an old building and take care of it for the next 50 years if you don't you know, make an investment. And is that a good use of your, your, your investment? And that would not be typically supported by the MSBA unless you, you pursued individual projects. So that's a very big ticket cost that we want to make available so people can understand that cost as well. Um, I want to stress the importance of the educational plan in all this, which really is the narrative that comes out of the visioning work that we do and the feedback that we get from the community and the varied stakeholders. That all translates then into a story uh, that we're going to use as a lens through which to compare all of the different alternatives and how well do we meet those different needs. And we can very simply create a matrix of all the, all the different priorities that have been established and, and see where each alternative falls on that matrix. There's another question that just came in. <laughs> have any schools gone the path of lead or other similar energy neutral or energy positive solutions? Um, so again, I can start this one. MSBA requires, as your funding partner, that you have either LEED or CHIPS, which is the Collaborative for High Performing Schools, some kind of green building rating uh, minimum. So we're going to go one way or the other. So that is absolutely a base requirement of this project. Beyond that, the sky is the limit. How much the, you know, the district and the town want to pursue you know, um, more um, let's say, pushing the envelope solutions to um, um, supplying ge geothermal. I mean, we will, again, work through this with our engineers and with your school building committee to look at all of the options. But I do want to say, you know, as a base, at, at the base level, you will have a LEED certified or a CHIPS certified project at the end of this process. That maybe is that there's a the MSBA provides an incentive for exceeding lead certified and achieving lead silver can earn uh, well it's equivalent roughly to lead silver but it's actually just a, an improvement over uh, the energy code of 20 percent um, and that would earn the school two additional reimbursement points um, so the MSBA would essentially provide more um, of their grant to the project. So that's often a conversation we'll have as a part of that discussion about lead versus chips and what is the goal and how does how is the cost benefit of those choices. I came in earlier that I did answer, um, but in case anyone is wondering, the rendering that's posted online, um, the question is really centered around have you thought about number of softball fields, baseball fields? I don't see, you know, um, has the rec director been consulted? Um, has has um, the athletics director been consulted? And the answer to that is no. <laughs> what is posted online was part of our interview process. It was meant to demonstrate our capabilities of, of visioning, of, of um, you know, looking at what you have, but not engaging in this conversation yet with you. So the short answer to that is no. Anything that's out there right now was entirely preliminary and not with your input. So please understand those renderings as just that very diagrammatic, very much not with your input and just a way to demonstrate possibility. I do not see any others online here.
more questions, then I want to thank you for coming out on this uh, June evening. And uh, there is a, an email address that will be on the website. So if you have future questions or um, thoughts, please feel free to utilize that email address and get the website or the link to the project website uh, up and running tomorrow. So thank you very much.